Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're in Paul's swan song, the last thing that he wrote, as he wrote to encourage this young man, Timothy. By the way, while you're praying, Brother Jim Pig shared with me that he hopes within the next few months or year to get set up to have a deliverance training school in his church, a center where people can come and train, specifically in deliverance. There are no schools anywhere that I know of that are teaching in-depth deliverance. And uh, he said the Lord spoke to him back a ways. He was praying. When the Lord gave him the new building, he was thanking the Lord for this wonderful facility that he had given. And it, it's a miracle story how it came about. And he said, the Lord told him, said, I want you to set up and lay out courses of study and deliverance to teach young people who are going to serve the Lord and others as well the methods of real deliverance and the Lord said to him Kenneth Hagin won't and Oral Roberts won't not they couldn't but they won't and he said I want you to do it so you might pray about that and uh, ask the Lord to give wisdom and guidance there will be an awful onslaught to stop it as you can imagine and uh, there needs to be a training center. And the Lord has spoken to him about this, so we just pray for him. In Second Timothy chapter 2, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. If we're going to be strong, we have to be strong in the grace that comes from one person alone, the Lord Jesus Christ. The things thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. This has always been God's method to pass along the truth. He gives the truth, he opens the truth, and then by the Holy Spirit he sends it out and then he gives it and entrusts it to faithful others, of others who will be faithful to go. Paul said, Timothy, you have heard me teach the truth in front of many witnesses. Now the same things that you've heard me teach, I want you to commit to faithful men. I know that you know these principles. You know these things. Commit them not to just everybody, but to faithful men. It's required of a steward that he be found faithful. There are a lot of people around, a lot of people who listen, but not too many who are faithful. Faithful people stick it out. Faithful people hang in when the storms hit. Faithful people make it through the storms. And he said, that's the ones you're looking for, the ones who have made it through the storms. Commit to them the truth, and they'll be able to teach others also. Thou, therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Well, that's unpopular today, isn't it? Endure hardness? No, no, no. You're supposed to come to church to endure softness and wonderful blessings and lovely, wonderful things. Well, that may be true. But he told Timothy, prepare to endure, to go through hard things. And that's exactly why you find the bombs blowing up around the deliverance people. They are being tested. You are being tested every day. I'm being tested every day to see what will be. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Good soldiers of Jesus Christ can endure hardness for the sake of the Lord. That tells you who the others are. Well, I can't bear it any longer. I can't stand it. Well, you'll never make a good soldier. You've got to determine to go through. Now, the only way you can do that is by dipping deep in the grace that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way you can do that, and I can do that, is to know that Jesus Christ is leading. The only way we can do that is to know that no matter how things look, Jesus Christ is leading us on to victory. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, 
No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. In other words, to be a good soldier, you cannot become entangled with everything that's going on in the world. To become entangled in the affairs of the world and to eclipse and to forget the things of God means you're disqualifying yourself as a soldier. A lot of people get involved in many, many good, wonderful activities to the point that they lose sight of the main thing. What is the main purpose that Jesus came to the earth for? To destroy the works of the devil. And God is looking for men and women who will make that the main point of their life. That doesn't mean that 24 hours a day they're on the war path, necessarily. But they are spending a great deal of their time and their energy and their mindset toward destroying the works of the devil. It's easy to get caught up in houses and lands and furniture and cars and success and coming and going and going and coming and lose sight of the main thing, which is that our warfare be successful and that we destroy the works of the devil. When you get out and see the desperate need of the people everywhere and how they come running to the deliverance meetings, starving, desperate for help, you begin to realize that almost nobody's paying the price to get this message out. It's pitiful. It's unbelievable. That God should be broadcasting, set my people free, and leaders are going about to build buildings, to have crusades, to do this, that, and the other good religious things, but they're not actively engaged in the battle to set people free. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully? We've talked about this before. Paul is making a reference to the Olympic Games, where they had these contests, the runners, and the other athletes who con uh, they came in and strove for mastery. They wanted to be the top one. Now he said if an athlete decides to try out, say, a track man, that he wants to run better than anybody else, and he strives, if he strives for mastery, if he strives to be the best, to be the top, he isn't crowned with the laurel reef crown, except he strives lawfully. And of course, you know that. You have to be in accordance with the rules if you're going to be if you're going to be what God wants you to be, you've got to uh, strive according to the rules. The rules are in God's Word. It's the same thing. You've seen it happen. Football game, basketball game, where somebody made a basket, somebody carried the ball across the line, and the referee called it and said, no, he stepped across the line a half inch right back here. And that canceled out the winning play. And everybody said, no, 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 no. But you see, it's against the rules. Step across the line. If you and I are going to win in this game of war, then we're going to have to learn the rules. Because you, you don't get the crown unless you strive lawfully. You've got to stay within God's uh, fences. Strive lawfully. And he's, he'll be crowned with the crown only, not only if he just runs and is the first one across the line, but he also has to be having kept the rules in order to do it. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruit. The husbandman, the farmer that labors must first partake of the fruit. If you're going to do deliverance, you need to take part in it yourself. One of the problems we've had is people who get involved in deliverance, but they don't need any more deliverance then. Always remember to live in an attitude where I know I'm going to need some more deliverance. If not now, sooner or later it's coming time. Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. 
but the word of God is not bound. He said, remember this, the reason I'm in bonds is because I preach that Jesus Christ is the seed of David. He was raised from the dead according to the gospel. And he said, for this, I'm in trouble. The resurrection message will get you in trouble with the enemy. They don't want that. And he said, I've been treated even as an evildoer, and I've even been put in bondage as a prisoner, but the word of God's not bound. I therefore endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He said, I'm willing to endure all things. Remember, he told Timothy to endure hardness, and he's setting the pace. He's enduring. It wasn't an easy thing to be a prisoner. It wasn't an easy thing to be castigated. It wasn't an easy thing to sit in, over here in Rome and get all these reports about um, people coming through and trying to tear up the churches he'd established. It wasn't easy. But he said, I'll endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, if we be dead with him, we'll also live with him. He said, you can bank on that. If we die with him, we'll also live with him. If we suffer, we'll also reign with him. The reason many believers are not reigning with the Lord is because they've never really suffered anything. You say, not me, I've suffered. But what did you suffer for? A lot of our suffering is our own foolishness, isn't it? I mean, you know, if you go out here and you eat something that you know is going to give you a tummy ache, then you suffer that night and you say, oh, I'm suffering. Well, you're not suffering for Jesus. You're suffering for foolishness. You knew you couldn't handle that and you, and you ate it anyway, and now you've now you got a tummy ache from it, see. Um, we do many foolish and hurtful things, and it brings suffering on us. But you can't classify that as suffering for Jesus. That's not suffering for the Lord. The suffering for the Lord comes about because you're faithful to him. It comes about because you are obedient to him. It comes about because you choose him instead of the world. And that's powerful, little of that going on. Most people are suffering because of foolishness, because of greediness, because of covetousness, because of ambition, because of pride, because of a lot of things. Well, I'm suffering. My feelings are hurt. Well, you're not suffering for Jesus. Because he hasn't got any use for that pride. The pride's all that's really hurt. You'll live over it. Mm -hmm. But you see, when we read in the Bible, if you suffer, you say, oh, yes, that's me. But if you analyze your suffering, a great deal of it, if not most of it, comes as a result of your own doings. It's not God's doings at all. It's not because you were faithful to Jesus that you're suffering. You say, oh, mine is. I'll tell you, I walked right up and witnessed to them, and then they just call me all kinds of names, and one of them popped me in the nose. I suffered for Jesus. Well, maybe, on the other hand, you may have been foolish. Did the Holy Spirit tell you to say that, or did you just take it on yourself? Hmm? You know, if, if the Holy Spirit tells you to do something, that's one thing. But a lot of this is just uh, ambition. I'll show them. I'll tell them. I'm not afraid. We've got to back up and learn how to hang loose and let the Holy Spirit tell us things. Let him lead us. Let him set a watch before our lips. And then let him speak through us. And it's amazing. Now then if you suffer as a result of that, fine. Then you're in that category. But you know, when you get to analyzing your own experiences, sometimes you don't come up with too much of that, do you? Sometimes we rush in where angels fear to tread. We need to ask the Father, if the angels are not tromping around over there, maybe it's not good ground for us either. Sometimes we decide we're going to brad the devil's nose, and we walk right into his lair. And God may take the view, I didn't send you there, so I'm not obligated to protect you. We get thrown out on our ear. Well, that's not God's fault. That's not suffering for Jesus. See, we've got to learn the difference between listening to the still, small voice, being brave and bold without being presumptuous. Well, he says, um, 
I endure all things for the elect's sake, so they can obtain salvation. We'll be dead with him, we'll live with him. If we suffer, we'll reign with him. There's a privilege that comes to those that suffer with Christ. You reign with him. If we deny him, he'll deny us. If we believe not, notice this, he throws us into hell. Is that what it says? If we believe not, he says, well, that's the end of them. Forget it. They lost it. That's all. Now, if we believe not, yet he abides or remains faithful. Why? For he cannot deny himself. You see, God has pledged himself. God has put his word forth. Jesus has backed up everything the Father has said. And he will not be unfaithful even though we are. That's a comfort, you know. Think of the times you've been unfaithful. You thought, oh boy, now God won't love me anymore. Conditional love. Then you found out that he remains faithful even when we're not. For he cannot deny himself. Of these things, put them in remembrance. That's what I'm doing. Putting you in remembrance of these things. Charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit. Remember, he's talking about words again, getting all caught up in words and splinters and spisms and spasms and squisms and schisms and everything else. He's saying, charging them before the Lord, they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the heroes. You can cause an awful lot of trouble getting into word splinters. And many of these false things are built on word splitting. They're not built on the mainstream of Scripture. They're built on little doubtful interpretations and twisted meanings. And then people grab on those like they're the whole Scripture and ride away and they end up subverting their hearers and themselves. And it destroys them and those who follow them. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. We're to study to show ourselves approved to God. This will make us workmen that don't need to be ashamed because we know how to divide up the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Profane and vain babblings produce more and more ungodliness. And their word will eat as does a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. My, he's just outspoken, isn't he? He puts his finger right on these two birds. He said, for example, these two birds, these turkeys, are nothing but trouble. Now, he should have been nice and said, now, you know, Brother Hymenaeus and Brother Philetus, you know, we need to love them. We need to pray for those dear brothers. They're causing all kinds of ungodly trouble in the church, but we need to love them and try to understand why they're so mean, full of the devil. No, he didn't. He just said, shun that kind of stuff. And he said, those kind of things, their word will eat like a canker. And he said, for example, of whom? This is what I'm talking about. Hymenaeus and Philetus, they're good examples of this. Those men, there are some people who will not listen. There are some people who will not heed. I don't care what you, how many times they're approached, how lovingly they're approached. They've got their minds made up, and the truth will have nothing, no effect on them whatsoever. And when that happens, there's nothing to do but what Paul did, and that's just turn from them. He said, who concerning the truth have erred. He said, they have gone into gross error concerning the truth. And they say the resurrection has passed already. When you get off the track and start off on one of these splinter things, the next thing you know, you'll end up denying verities of the faith. You get off on a holiness kick, and the next thing you know, you won't need deliverance. And you will be better than anybody else. 
and you'll be well nigh perfect in this body. And of course, you'll be making an absolute fool of yourself. Because everybody can see how you're not what you're saying except you and a few that may follow along with you. But actually, you're not really any, any, any good at all. You can go off on following somebody who says, well, you're not really born again when you ask Jesus in your heart. But that just prepares you to go through several marvelous stages to get you ready for a glorious outflowing of the presence of God so that you can be born again. Anybody that's that far off on salvation has erred from the truth. They're way off in left field. And chances are they'll never come back. And you are a fool to try to follow them out there and try to get them back. You better stay on high ground and realize that if they're that far off, they're in trouble. Gross, serious trouble. If you get hung in with people who are who think they're going to become immortal in this body, which is contrary to everything the scripture teaches, who think that heaven's down here on earth instead of up where he said it was, you're, you're fooling with gross error. And he says, these men have erred concerning the truth. Now, that's just a few examples. But when people get off, they'll end up off in some major area. Stay close to the mainstream of truth. Don't be wiggle-woggled off after some strange, wonderful new thing. The main verities of truth are extremely plain and simple. And when they begin to get complicated and twisted up in knots where you can't hardly unravel them, you better watch out. You may be over in another pasture that doesn't belong to the Lord at all. They said the resurrection's passed already. And said so they've overthrown the faith of some. They've even shaken up some baby believers. And Paul comes down hard on them because they're already destroying the faith of babies. And that's bad news. Nevertheless, he said in spite of Hymenaeus and Philetus and all these other birds that are checking out and going their own separate ways, nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. He said, I'll guarantee you one thing, God hadn't lost track of anybody that really belongs to him. The foundation is sure, it's steady, it's holding fast. And all these other people can teach whatever they want to. They can practice whatever they want to. But the foundation of God will stand sure. When I was in St. Louis, I heard about churches that are growing. Well, I call them the mushroom tabernacles. I mean, in a night or two, they just whoosh. And here they are, 800, 1,000, 1,500 people. I was talking to a pastor down there, and he said, you know when?" Every one of those seems to be built on what they call worship and praise. And a super music program. A rat a tat tat. Hoopy doo music program. And I got the picture. They're built on worship and praise and a super jazzy music program. And you know what they do? They go down there to have a great emotional upheaval. There's nothing wrong with worshiping the Lord. There's nothing wrong with feeling good about it, crying, shouting, jumping, whatever you want to do. If you really, really get touched with the Lord. But to go into church and think that's worship every time, you can get in a rut too. A rut's a grave that's open at both ends. Now God will deal with you as an individual. There'll be times you'll come into a service and you'll worship the Lord. You'll sit there, maybe tears come down your face, and you'll be worshiping the Lord. Other people may be waving their hands around. Other people may be laughing. Other people may be um, praying in tongues. They may be doing worshiping the Lord in many ways. And you're worshiping the Lord in the way that he wants you to. Another time you'll switch and do something else. Don't get hooked in the same old rut all the time. And don't think that everybody has to worship the Lord the same way. Let people be free. Let them be free to reach out to the Lord in the way that blesses them and in which they exalt and magnify Jesus. 
But I've seen so much of this across the country. These are, I call them the mushroom tabernacles because it doesn't take long to have one. And they're always building buildings. They just can't build buildings fast enough to get the people in them. And they're always led by young green leaders and uh, who are just feeding them John 3.16 with a, with, a, with a dash of Acts 1.8. And that's about it. They're not getting much else. And they go into spasms of worship every time they enter the house. They, they start leaping. They start praising. But, you know, I wonder, if they read War on the Saints, they might go back and evaluate what's really happening to them. They're having an experience. There's no doubt about that. But there's lots of people have experiences. The Satan worshipers have experiences. The witches have experiences. And if you get into one of these fluff and feathers churches, you'll have experiences. They'll be good. They'll make you feel good. But they won't change your life. And they won't dig deep into the furrows where the enemy is hiding. And they won't get you on your feet so that you can worship the Lord outside the church as well as in. I know some people, I've bumped into some people, they said, oh, I can hardly wait to go down to the church so I can praise the Lord. Well, now, church is a good place to praise the Lord, I'll grant you. But if that's the only time you can praise the Lord, you're in sad shape. You're a spiritual wreck. You're just a, you're a hulk. You're an empty shell. It's good to worship and praise God when God's people gather. But if you don't have anything to praise the Lord about when you're by yourself, you're in trouble. Well, the foundation of God stands sure. God knows who, who belongs to him. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, some also of wood and of earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. Now, you know, what he's saying is simply this. There are vessels made out of gold and silver in houses. Others are made out of clay, earth or clay, some of wood, some are made for honor and some are dishonor. They have some, you know, that are used for disposing of human waste. You could call those kind of dishonorable, wouldn't you? I mean, uh, uh, before we had modern plumbing, you know, they had, uh, they had little uh, special containers that you used during the night to keep them having to go outside. And you might call those vessels to dishonor in a sense. They weren't exactly the honorable things. I mean, you wouldn't want to set them on the table, serve out it. You wouldn't want to cook a pot of soup in them, you know. They were used for something else. And for their purpose, they, they served a very good purpose. But, I mean, you wouldn't want to take a bedpan, you know, and, and ladle the soup out of it or anything. But even though it's a perfectly good container, it's a vessel that's used for something else. And that's what he's saying. In a house, there are various vessels of different degrees of value and they are assigned for certain things. Now, uh, if any man, if a man therefore purge himself from these, so he says, name the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. If you purge yourself from these things, then you can be a vessel unto honor. Now, if you just want to be the slop bucket, well, I mean, you don't bother purging. Just, you know, you, you get stuff dumped on you. But if you really have ambitions to walk with the Lord, or you, you really want to be his vessel, then set about to cleanse yourself and make yourself meet, sanctified or set apart, and meet or fitting for the master's use, prepared for every good work. In other words, get your life in order so that anything God wants to use you for, you'll be clean enough for, you'll be ready, you'll be empty and ready to be used for the glory of the Lord. It's not anything that, that complicated in that, is there? Flee also youthful lust. Now, a lot of times people get in trouble, especially when they're young. They, they face strong desires. Lust includes sex, but it's not, that's not the only thing. There's ambition. There's um, all kinds of immaterial things that uh, 
people lust or have strong desires to possess. And he says, flee those youthful lusts. Sometimes you'll get tangled up with them. You say, well, I can, I can, I can hold out. I got a strong will. And the next thing you know, kaboom, and back you are in the ditch again. You say, I don't know how that happened. Well, see, he told Timothy, he said, flee, run off and leave them. There's always a way around. Sometimes the way is no. What a terrible thing to say. You say, well, preacher, I just couldn't help it. You know, there I was, and there was just nothing I could do. Yeah, you could have said no and turned and walked out the door. Well, what a dreadful thing to say. Many times that's the way out. Well, what would they think of me? Well, who cares what they think of you? What do you think of yourself after you listened to them and did what they said? Hmm? Have, I started to say intestinal fortitude, have the guts to say no and turn away and walk away from those things. Because if you stay around them, you can still get entangled in them. Walk away from them. If you have long ears that kind of like t pick up and tune in on smutty jokes out at work, turn and walk away. Get out of earshot so you can't hear it. You say, oh, I'm strong. <laughs> hmm? If you walk up in the locker room and here's a dirty picture up there, turn away from it. Don't say, I'm strong. See, that's the way you get hooked. Flee youthful lust. When you come in contact with something, you know you have a weakness in that area, you had a weakness for it, then get away from it. Move as quickly as possible so that you not be entangled with it. Flee youthful lust says nothing I'd rather run away and fight again than to stay there and be swamped wouldn't you you say well they'll say I'm a sissy okay so what who cares what they say anyway you're interested in what the Lord says and what you think about yourself alright and he said flee those youthful desires but follow these are the things you cultivate righteousness Faith, love, peace with those or them or those people that call on God out of a pure heart. In other words, you need to be with some of God's people who have like objectives. If you stay with the other crowd all the time, you're going to end up slipping in the ditch. There's no way around it. You're not made out of steel and you're not invulnerable. You say, oh, I, that doesn't bother me anymore. I wouldn't take a chance with it. It's not worth it. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing they do gender stripes. Here we are again. Paul really comes down hard on this business of fussing and nitpicking. The Word of God has enough mainstream doctrine for you to stay on that and preach and teach and discuss it and study it the rest of your life without getting off in some of the bypaths trying to find some special new doctrine that nobody ever heard about. If you want a real challenge, dig in the wells of deliverance. I'm telling you, there's much, much more down there. It hasn't even begun to be scratched. The surface has just been scratched on it. Well, they gender or raise strifes. They create strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, ooh, but be gentle to all men, apt to teach, patience, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Now, you want to you be a leader? Here's what you got to be. You say, well, that's hard. I know. You say, when do you get like that? I don't know. Takes a while. You, you do it, and then you redo it, and then you redo it, and then you redo it again. And you just keep on. God keeps on reminding you that this is what you're supposed to do. 
you instruct those that oppose themselves. You have the problem of trying to get the attention of people who are destroying themselves by their foolish behavior and their foolish attitudes and their wrong goals and wrong motivations. That's the job, is to get the truth to them so they will stop opposing themselves. They're literally tearing themselves apart. And then he says, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Our business is to get to them if we can with the truth. Gentle, apt to teach, patient, and with gentleness instructing them that oppose themselves. Because it's possible that God will get through to them and cause them to repent and acknowledge the truth. That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. See, when they're in this kind of condition, they're in the snare of the devil. Who are taken captive by him at his will. Does it sound like demons can't bother Christians? It's talking about believers who are snared by the devil and who have been taken captive by him at his will. You know what that's talking about? Believers who are so weak, so unlearned in the scriptures that the devil can just at will capture them. They are so ignorant, so unlearned that anything coming along, they'll swallow it up and be caught in a snare. Our business is to get people instructed, get them on their feet, so they won't be an easy prey to the devil. That they'll be equipped not only to recognize the truth, but to be moving and, and working toward truth. I started to say striving, and I remembered the servant of the Lord wasn't supposed to strive. We, we need to help them to understand Bible principles. In order to do this, we must grasp them ourselves. We must learn to apply them. We must learn that they really work. Then we can, with conviction, urge others to try this same method and say, I know it works because... Now, at first you say, I know it works because God says so. But after you've tried it yourself, and after you've seen it work in the lives of other people as well, you'll be able to say, I know it's true because God says so, and also because I've seen it work in me and in other people and you can urge people to try it. And this is our job, to recover them out of the snare of the devil. When they're recovered out of the snare of the devil, they are to be strengthened, and they are to be made aware of the enemy and how to deal with him, to get themselves on their feet and get them functioning, get them ministering in Jesus' name themselves. This is our purpose and plan. Oh, this is God's purpose and plan is to not only rescue us, but to turn us into workers, to turn us into soldiers who will have a concern and a compassion for others who have been caught in the snare of the devil. It's awfully easy when you've come out of the snare of the devil, it's been a long, good while since you were really knocked down flat. Oh, you have these little nasty things gnawing at you and everything, but, you know, it's been a while since you were really flat down and out. And then you run across somebody who comes in, you know, and they're down flat and out. Sometimes we think, oh, come on, snap out of it. Forgetting that was not the way someone dealt with us when we came. When we came all broken and snared, what was it that kept us coming back to Hagwish? The love and the concern of the people who, though they didn't agree with what we were doing, they loved us with a real love and genuinely wanted to help us. Let's always try to maintain that and try to remember that this person may be trying as hard as they can. Now, there are times when you have to be very stern with people. If they're just playing games, if they're just fiddling around with God, then somebody's got to have love them enough to say, hey, look, you're going to have to pull your act together. If you really want help, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to buckle down. Quit playing and get down to business. But on the other hand, you see, only the Holy Spirit can give you that discernment. But you remember some of you who were so broken and torn when you first came here, so bound, and so some were bound in religion, some were bound with drugs, some with alcohol, some with sex, some with music, some with multitudes of things. And the thing that helped you most 
Think back to what really got you. Think back to the people, the person or people who really stand out in your mind as being keys to helping you get free. It was those who were concerned about you, who loved you, who, who tried with all they knew to help you and to reach out to you and encourage you. Now, if that helps you, it'll help other people who are coming in too. We need to remind ourselves of that every once in a while because we all tend to say, well, you know, come on, snap out of it, let's get going. You know, I passed that a long time ago. That's no problem. It was back then. It's not a problem anymore, thank God. But it was once a dreadful problem. And God would have those of us who've come out of these things to go back and reach down to those who are desperately groping. They're just beginning to realize there may be help. We've already received it. What a joy to share with them patiently and lovingly that they can be helped. And also remember this, that when you hit somebody with some problem that you don't really know, because I never had anything like this, that doesn't mean you can't extend love and understanding to them. If God gives you grace, you can extend love and understanding to them, even though you don't know the depths of their problem, but you know that Jesus meets the need. So don't automatically count yourself out because, well, I don't know anything about that. I mean, it's good to have somebody who's been down that trail. Sometimes they can uh, give special help. But I'd give it a shake if I were you. If I were assigned to somebody and they, they needed help in an area that I wasn't familiar with, I'd say, I'd, first I'd say, Lord, if you can use me, I'll, I'll be your mouthpiece. I'll give them the scripture. I'll tell them what I know. And then I'll call in maybe specialized help if we need it. You'd be surprised how many of people you can help even though you don't think you can. Don't sell the Lord short. The Holy Spirit in you can do many marvelous things. And all of us need to grow in our understanding and our sensitivity to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us, especially when we come down to minister to each other and to those who come in for help. Praise God for a Lord who cares about deliverance and who wants us to be free. Thank God for the good news coming in from the deliverance fronts everywhere. That the bombs are blowing up, but that deliverance is continuing in spite of everything. Thank God for the news that many, many people are waking up and are moving into the position to learn and study about deliverance. I believe that we're going to see a, a tremendous explosion of deliverance this year. We're going to see a lot of false and spurious deliverance. Don't let that discourage you. That always happens. You know, when the, when, the, when the Lord starts moving, the devil always raises up a counter move. And the counter move, of course, is not going to do any good. It'll just be spurious. It'll, it'll go, and then it'll be gone. But I believe that there's going to be a, a real heart throb of deliverance go through the body of Christ. And I, I'm kind of persuaded that it's going to at least get started good this year. We've got, we've got outposts all across the country and even around the world. People are beginning to move into deliverance. And if we'll continue to pray and be faithful, God's going to teach us even more. And we're looking for new breakthroughs this year. Be on the alert. God is going to speak to some warrior on the battlefield and show them new things about deliverance. It won't be new to God. It'll be new to us. The things that will work and set people free. You could be that man or woman. Amen? Praise the Lord. Don't sell yourself short. You say, oh, well, I never did that well then. It doesn't make a difference if you're a warrior, if you're willing to be a soldier. The soldiers are the ones that God's going to show these things to. Be a soldier. Be on the alert for God to teach you. And then, of course, be glad to share it with others so they, too, can put principles into operation which will uh, destroy the works of the devil even quicker and with more thoroughness. Now, if you're here tonight and you've never asked Jesus in your heart or you're not sure you have, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If you've never done this, if you've never asked him to come in your heart, or you're not sure about it, would you like to? He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. If you've never done this or you're not sure you have, why don't you do it tonight? Would you like to? You could do it where you sit, where you stand. But you know, if, that, if you try it and it doesn't seem to clear up the doubts and fears, there are going to be workers down here at the front. Just walk up here and say, I need to talk to somebody about salvation. That's all you need to say. You indeed may have salvation. The devil may have just thrown a curve to you and got you all confused. 
but it can be quickly found out by examining it in the light of the Word of God. Somebody will sit down with the Word of God, go over God's plan of salvation, see if that's what you're trusting. If it is, then you can know that you're born again. Then you're all right. If you're not trusting the Word of God, you can trust it tonight and believe in it. Somebody can help point you the way. Either way, you'll come out better. If you're, that's not your problem, but you're driven, harassed, and tormented, this is producing compulsive behavior. And this slows you down, stops you, or even reverses spiritual growth of progress. You're talking about the work of demons. These signs shall follow them that believe. My name shall they cast out devils. That's why we do it, and we encourage you to come. There are many workers here, and you can very quickly get a man or woman to help you with a demonic problem if you think you have one. And then another sign that follows believers, they shall speak with new tongues. If you haven't received this gift from the Lord, that's what it is. Just like your salvation, it's a gift. You're entitled to it. Someone here could share with you and show you how to receive it and even help you if you're interested. Another sign that follows believers, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. If you have physical problems, come. There are people who believe that Jesus heals today. They can join in prayer with you, lay hands on you in Jesus' name for your healing. Let's stand. Sing something about that name as we do. You have a need.